Hi everyone, this is Josh Nelson. We've got a few minutes left here until we'll get started, but I want to make sure that everybody can get logged in and can see the presentation. We've actually got a chat feature in here. I don't know if anybody can locate that, but the chat feature actually will let you type some notes into me. And I'll do my best to try to catch that as we go. If there's questions or comments or if you guys have trouble seeing a particular feature, we actually have a video in here as well. Uh, we've tested it out and you should be able to hear it well, but that's the sort of stuff that would be helpful for me to know as we go. So we've got about five minutes until we start here, and I bet we are going to see a bunch of people jump in here in the next few minutes. And actually, I can see you know, a couple of attendees right now, Scott and Nathan, if you could do me a favor, could you type something in the chat field just to make sure that it's working properly? Hi, Scott. Thank you. And the webinar today, we're actually going to be recording. So all of these we're trying to make a recording of and make these available on our YouTube channel after the fact. Not only can you go back and listen to it, but a lot of times you may be attending something like this and recognize that, hey, you know, this is something that my coworker or my spouse or my friend really should be hearing. They really should have been here. So definitely make sure that you're providing them that link after the fact so you can pass that on and they can share in the information. This is the first time that we have done this particular topic, the true cost of investing. And it's been a hot topic this year, actually. We'll get into that in a few minutes on why. But yeah, there's a lot of these terms that are being thrown around now that people hadn't even heard before. For example, fiduciary. Fiduciary is going to come up a few different times in the presentation. I'm sure that you've seen it some place if you pay any attention to the financial medium. See somebody else has joined here. Welcome, Blaine. All right, it looks like Blaine can type in the chat field. That's very good. We are just trying this out this year, actually, doing a lot of webinars. And so it's new to us. We're getting better and better as time goes on. We've tried a few different formats and a few different software programs and finally have settled on something that works out really well for us. So definitely would love feedback after the presentation to let us know how this worked and also any other topics that you'd like us to do. We've got a bunch of them in the queue right now that we're working on, so we always appreciate more topics. And obviously if we're getting a lot of people that are saying that the same topic is interesting or it would be helpful, we want to make sure that we put that at the top. Hi, Wayne. Looks like we've got another person who's joined. Every time we've done webinars, uh, the cool thing is that we get more and more people, so our numbers are growing as we go. And we get a, a pretty wide variety. Sometimes it, it's existing clients, and sometimes it's friends of clients, family of clients. So that's really how our reach has always been growing is by word of mouth. So we certainly appreciate not only our clients attending, but anybody who is just checking us out or just here to learn a little bit today. 
We'll wait one more minute here and get started. All right, by my clock, or by Microsoft's clock, I guess, we are officially at noon right now, so I'll get started. My name is Josh Nelson, and I am a certified financial planner and also the founder and CEO of Keystone Financial Services. We are known and have been, even before we were called Keystone, we've been known as being educators. And it was kind of interesting. That was what my dad did as a profession, actually. He was a teacher, and when he was first starting to teach, as you can imagine, especially a beginning teacher, they don't make a lot of money. And so my dad was in a Kiwanis club at the time. And one of the other guys that was at the Kiwanis club said, hey, you want to work for me in the summer? And it turns out that the guy was a manager at an animal feed company back in Iowa. And so my dad became a, a hog feed salesman in Iowa and ended up making a lot more money doing that than teaching. And he actually did both. He, he actually did both along the way. So it was kind of interesting that I got a little bit of each from my dad and that I got the educator piece and that I get to do a lot of education, financial education, and also the, the salesperson piece, which hopefully um, a lot of you don't see me as a salesperson, but you know, there's no question that my job is to help influence people, to help influence people to, to make better choices about their money. And really today the, the goal is to educate you on the cost of investing which traditionally has been a mystery in the financial services industry. We have not been very good as an industry at making it plain as far as how people are paying for their investment strategies, for their advice, and that's really the way we put this together was to make it very plain to people. This is a goal of ours this year has been to become much more transparent and accountable to our clients because we know that's important. We know that people are expecting that. As I alluded to a little bit earlier, in April of this year, the Department of Labor is a uh, basically as you know, appointees of the Obama administration, and they issued new regulations that now require anybody who gives advice to retirement plan participants to be considered a fiduciary. And until April, a lot of people didn't even know what that term meant, but it's been thrown around so much in the financial media over the past six months that I'll throw it out a couple times and make sure that I'm defining what that means. But uh, suffice to say, I've been a fiduciary and have been for many years. And really what a fiduciary means is that it's somebody who act, has to act in your best interest first. You have to put your best interest first. And a lot of people say, well, duh, if you call yourself a financial advisor, a financial planner, isn't that just assumed? Well, you're right, it's assumed, but it is not always the case. In fact, traditionally in our industry, if you called yourself a financial planner or a financial advisor, it usually meant that you were a product salesperson for a company. Oftentimes it would be a Merrill Lynch or a Smith Barney or something like that, one of the big wire houses. But traditionally that's what you would have been looking at as somebody who really was just selling product and was being paid on commission. So as we go through today, keep that term in mind, fiduciary. It means that it's somebody who is legally bound to put your best interests first and to make sure that you're fully informed about what you're doing, fully informed about what you're paying, and fully informed about what you're getting as a result of the cost. Glad that we have so many attendees today. It looks like we've got 10 in the queue, and we might get a couple more that jump in. Again, I mentioned before that this is being recorded, so all of the information that you're hearing right now we're going to record and put on our YouTube channel. You also will find an archive there of our past presentations so you can go back and, and find topics. But really what we're trying to do is, is have this financial education piece be something that we're not just doing in person. Sometimes we'll get a meeting room or, or do a smaller group room in our office that will be educational. But for a lot of people that doesn't work. It, it doesn't work because of their schedule, because of where they work, because of where they live. And so we really try to boost up webinars as our means of trying to deliver financial education. So let's get started. When we look at today's goals, there's a few real basic goals in what I'm trying to, to help you understand. 
the number one goal is what you're paying for and why. When you're paying for financial advice, it's important to understand what it is exactly that you're paying and what it is exactly that you're getting. That brings us to number two, is that there's a correlation between investment value, performance, and expenses. So in general, having lower expenses is a good thing. Not always. Sometimes in life you're paying for something and you're not getting any more value. But in some cases you're paying more and you, you do get value. For example, I'm looking out my window right now and I can see a few hotels out here and there's a big difference. I can see the Embassy Suites. For a lot of people they'd say, yep, that's a pretty good experience at the Embassy Suites and there's a very big difference between uh, that and the Candlewood Suites <laughs> is uh, just a little bit uh, you know, over on the horizon for me. So both will do the job. It's true that both will give you a place to stay, hopefully clean and safe in both locations. But at Embassy Suites, you're probably going to get a better experience. And in a lot of cases, you don't end up paying that much more. That's part of what we'll unpack today. And then number three questions to ask your financial advisor or financial services provider. When I say financial services provider, it could be your 401k, for example. A lot of times people think that, well, my employer is paying for that. And that's not the case. You're actually paying for your investments inside the 401k. So you want to make sure that you know exactly what it is that you're, you're paying and what questions to be asking. So fee transparency. Really, the, the important thing about transparency is that you can, you can see it. You, know, you can actually see the cost. And in our industry, there's a lot of embedded cost in financial products that people have no idea that they're actually paying. So it, it's important to understand that. I've tried to do a, a better job over the last few years because sometimes you know, we get into this industry and we start to make assumptions as far as what people know and they don't know. So I've tried to elevate that discussion within my meetings with clients. So really there, there is a relationship between fees and value. Um, you really do need to unpack what it is exactly that you're getting for increased fees because in general, the higher the fee is, the lower your return is going to be over time. So it's important to understand that the, as your, your costs go up, as you're looking at higher and higher cost, you should be expecting higher and higher value. Also, it's important to understand that uh, you know, when, when you're looking at your long-term financial goals and objectives, that you've really got to take that into account, that your objectives may be very different from uh, somebody who is in a different stage of their life or maybe in a different economic status. Everybody has a little bit different situation. It's important that, that the fees that you have in your investments or that you're paying for advice, that they be fully disclosed. And that's always crucial, I think, is the disclosure. Ideally, you're able to actually see it on your statement. And for most of our clients, that's how they're, they're paying for their investment cost. They're actually seeing it as a line item on their statement so they know exactly what it is. They, uh, they're able to, uh, to, to see on a pretty frequent basis what it is that they're actually paying for everything. But at the very least, you want to make sure that it's disclosed and to, to know where to get that information. So if your advisor, ideally, whoever you're working with right now, they, they really should be able to explain how you're paying. I just had somebody in last week. It was a prospective client. But she was in a situation that uh, she had had a family member pass away and had gone to a, a person who called themselves a financial advisor, and they told her that their investments had no cost, that they, that it was free, that the uh, that their that investor, and it turns out it was a very very high cost investment. It's just that it was sold as an indexed annuity. And the, the bottom line is you look in that prospectus, it actually does disclose where all the fees, where all the gotchas are, and it can be quite substantial. So if somebody tells you that you're getting something for free, that's not possible. And I think we all know that, that it, uh, it's a little bit too good to be true. So there's always going to be some fees or expenses, and that does impact what kind of return you get over time. So we're going to really drill down on this. and. I'll warn you, it can be confusing, and you probably already know that. You can probably already know that there are things that you don't know, things that you, uh, you aren't aware of, and that's probably why you're here today. So we're going to go through a few different product classifications. When I say product, that's the actual investment vehicle that you have inside your account. So over 90 million people in 2014 owned individual mutual funds. And a mutual fund is just a collection of investments within an investment company. 
So a mutual fund is actually an investment company and what they're doing for you is they're going out and selecting different types of assets within their fund. I'm a little bit vague on that just because it could be lots of different things. It could be stocks, it could be bonds, it could be real estate holdings, uh, it could be all kinds of different in investment vehicles that would be within that, that fund and it's an investment company. So the nice thing about mutual funds is it's a very easy way to get professional management, very easy way to get diversification. Those are good things and we always want that, right? We always want to make sure that you've got somebody steering the ship and you want to make sure that you don't have all your eggs in one basket and to throw out a couple of overused metaphors. But it's important to understand exactly what it is that you're paying for that fund. In most cases, if you have a 401k or if you've had a 401k, so we, about all of us would have to raise our hand on that, you probably only had mutual funds as your investment choices within that portfolio. You may not have recognized that if you saw a name like a Fidelity Contra fund or a Vanguard fund within the portfolio, you probably saw that as the label. That's probably a mutual fund. That's probably what it is that you owned. So sometimes it's hard to understand what it is that you're actually paying. and we seen a lot of research come out on this the last couple of years that the costs on mutual funds are actually much higher than what is showing up if you looked in a prospectus or if you looked on Morningstar.com it might have a stated expense ratio for a fund but the reality is they're not required to disclose all of their expenses within that expense ratio hence a lot of the portfolio changes that we've made this year inside our client accounts so when we look at mutual fund operating expenses, here's why it's so confusing because it's not just a line item, it's not straightforward, you've got all kinds of expenses that could be associated with that mutual fund. So we can go through the list here, front end sales load, basically it means a sales commission that you paid that, that person who sold it to you, uh, means that you probably aren't paying a fee, you're probably not paying an ongoing fee to have that managed, but you did pay an upfront commission. Number two would be a back-end load. Don't you love that, by the way, load? Doesn't that sound great? Uh, doesn't it sound so like something that you want to have in your investment? Well, back-end load, that means that you have a sales charge, but it's contingent. It means that it's on the back-end. So typically, you would need to leave the investment for a certain number of years, or you pay a deferred sales charge on the back-end, uh, which means that you're stuck. And this particular uh, investor, this prospective client that was in last week, she actually owned a product that required her to leave the investment for 15 years or she would have to pay a deferred sales charge. Can you imagine that? Being committed for 15 years in any kind of an investment. Just completely ridiculous. As you can imagine, the sales commission that was probably quite high to have convinced somebody to put their money away for 15 years. Uh, yeah, it, it drives me crazy when I see stuff like that. Number three, redemption fees. It could be some other kind of cost that's on the back end to get money out. Exchange fees, those would be fees to move between one fund and another, even within the same fund family. Account maintenance fees, those would be things like an annual custodial charge that you're paying. Maybe if you have an IRA, for example, you could be paying an annual fee. Uh, purchase fees, management fees, distribution or 12B1 fees and then other expenses. So uh, we're going through these a little bit quickly because of course we could spend a lot of time on any one expense. But I just throw this out because it's not as straightforward as just looking at an expense ratio. Uh, you could look at an expense ratio on a fund and it looks quite low but it might turn out that that person actually paid four or five percent in an upfront sales load that's not factored into that. It may not be included in that expense ratio. So it is important to understand that this is complex. This is not a, a real straightforward deal where you can just look at one number. Exchange traded funds. These are a little bit newer vehicle. They've actually been around for a long time. If anybody's heard of the uh, symbol SPY, that's the Spider S&P 500 index. That's actually been around for decades. And uh, that's one of the oldest ones, but most exchange traded funds are newer vehicles. Basically, they're not actively managed. Most are not actively managed. They're basically just built to track various indices like the S&P 500 or the Dow or the NASDAQ. There may be certain stock market indices that you want to track with your portfolio. The average is 50 basis points, and you can see on the slide they're non-leveraged. 
non-leveraged means that that it's it's just kind of a standard portfolio. Their reality is that the the non-leveraged ETFs are a lot cheaper. There are leveraged ETFs though, which means that they're actually borrowing money within the portfolio. As you can imagine, those can be quite risky in some cases. So you want to be real careful from an investment standpoint what it is that you actually own in there. That's not something that we typically would use in a client's portfolio. But the big difference between an exchange traded fund and a mutual fund is that an exchange traded fund is probably cheaper, the expenses are probably lower, it's probably not actively managed, and it uh, it actually trades on a almost you know second by second basis. They're actually traded throughout the day like a stock, so you can actually buy the S&P 500 in one ticker symbol and then sell it you know 10 minutes later, and obviously you'd sell it at a different price than what you bought it versus mutual funds are just traded once per day. There also can be some differences there with spreads, and that, would, again, would be that purchase and sale price. When you buy a stock and sell a stock, even if it's within a very, very short amount of time and nothing happened, you know, like the CEO resigned or something like that, there's going to be a difference. So if you bought and sold, you know, within split seconds, for example, you actually would lose money. I mean, almost guaranteed you'd lose money because, there are market makers that that's how they make money is on spreads and so that actually ends up eroding some of your returns especially if you're trading frequently so it's really important here to stick with liquid funds that are very they're very liquid they trade a lot like the S&P 500 they had some trouble here a few years ago if you remember the flash crash that was a situation where the market dropped really quickly and who got hurt really badly in that were people who owned exchange traded funds, for example, that didn't trade a lot. Those could have been huge differences in spreads, and you could have lost a lot of money very, very quickly if you happen to be trading during that time frame. So it's important to make sure that you don't go with anything too exotic when it comes to exchange traded funds, or you could end up getting hurt from an investment perspective. You could end up seeing losses on something that you thought was quite conservative even. Annuities, these are insurance vehicles. So if you ever have owned an annuity or, or purchased an annuity, you probably were talking to somebody who was licensed for insurance, and maybe they were licensed for insurance and investments. But basically what a, a annuity is, it's an insurance product. It would be issued by an insurance company. And what they would be doing is they would be saying, we're going to guarantee you something. We're going to guarantee you some type of payment now or in the future off of this annuity. So it's an insurance contract. They're guaranteeing something to you, and that could be a guaranteed death benefit. It could be an income that you couldn't outlive. It could be a situation where you may be guaranteed something, but many, many years in the future. So for example, this person that had the 15-year the annuity, it's true that there are guarantees built into it, but those guarantees are they have lots of asterisks associated with them. You have to meet a lot of conditions to be able to get those guarantees. So it's important to understand what it is exactly that you've got. You might tell that I, I have a little bit of a negative opinion on annuities, and that's because a lot of people that own annuities don't understand why they own them, and they're probably paying a lot higher in cost than they really know. In fact, oftentimes when a, a prospective client comes in and they show me an, annu an annuity statement, We'll start to look at it, and I, I'll ask him, you know, do you remember why it is that you bought this? You know, what was it that you were really looking for? And as it turned out, in a lot of cases, those discussions resulted in them saying, I didn't even know that it did that. And in a, in a lot of cases, they say, I didn't even want that. You know, I don't need a guaranteed death benefit. I've got life insurance or, or something else. So it could be that they're paying for something that they really don't want or don't need. So it, important to make sure that you understand what you've got. In some cases, annuities can be a great vehicle for tax deferral. It can be a great vehicle to guarantee an income stream if that's what you're looking for. But recognize that the insurance company is not doing this for free. They are charging you something to have your money in an annuity. Three basic types of annuities are fixed, variable, and indexed. I'll throw out just a couple of bullet points on each. Fixed annuities are kind of like a CD except the guarantee is from the insurance company, not the FDIC or the government or something like that. Basically, it's, it's a contract that would give you interest in that annuity uh, for as long as it's in there. So you might buy a five-year annuity, and maybe it's paying 1.5%, 2% right now. 
So you know that you would be getting that kind of interest paid into it for that period of time. At the end of five years, you probably could just take the money and walk with it at that point like you could with a CD. A variable annuity is one that instead of having the fixed interest rate, the underlying investment vehicles would be something else that's not guaranteed. So it could be conservative, it could be aggressive, could be things that are like mutual funds that you'd be invested in. So some people may want that and they may want that and the annuity might have some other type of guarantee associated with it. And then the third one, indexed annuities, these make me bristle a bit when I talk about them because these are the ones that seem to be missold the most because the way that they often are sold by a product salesperson that you might hear this from is they sell it as that it's guaranteed. You cannot lose money and you get all the upside of the market or, or they'll say you get you know, most of the upside of the market. The reality is that there, there's some truth to that uh, depending on how you color it. Uh, index annuities can be guaranteed as long as you hold on to them for a certain period of time. So for example, in, in our example of the folks, uh, the, the woman that came in last week, she had uh, something that was guaranteed for 15 years, but uh, only after the 15 years. So as you can imagine, who knows what they're going to be doing seven years from now, eight years from right now. To me, that doesn't seem like a good trade-off. So the indexed annuity is one that uh, typically you'll have some participation in the market, and that'll be the interest or the earnings that you'll accumulate in the contract will be tied to some type of market index, which kind of sounds good, right? You say, well, that's kind of good. Actually, well, I'd like to participate in the market and not be able to lose money. But the reality is that they attach what are called caps, and the cap says that, well, yeah, you'll participate in the market, but only up until this amount, and then you don't get it. So, for example, it could be a 5% cap, so you could do as good as gain 5% in a year, or if the market was flat to negative, then you wouldn't get anything. So I unpack that a little bit just because those are seem to be the ones that are the biggest culprits out there for abuse of the people that are selling them. Not to say that they can't ever be useful, but you want to be real careful as far as what you own. Annuity fees can be high because there's all kinds of internal charges that you don't actually see in most cases. Mortality and expense risk charge, basically that is going to be the annuity's base expenses. Oftentimes will include some type of a debt benefit one and a quarter percent per year is pretty typical. Administrative fees typically will be talk, tapped on uh, top of that. That can range and then the underlying sub-account expenses. However, these don't include costs for additional benefits. If you are paying for some type of an income guarantee or a withdrawal guarantee, that probably is going to be on top of any other expenses. And then finally, penalties. On annuities, they work just like retirement accounts in that if you take money out before 59 and a half, you do pay a 10% tax penalty on that. So these can be used as tax deferral vehicles, for example. Let's say that we had a 30-year-old professional athlete that has a few million bucks in the bank and they want to put some money away for retirement. That could actually be a good benefit for them to have that tax deferral on a few million dollars and that all the earnings would accumulate tax deferred until they actually retire, 59 and a half. But if that professional athlete said so they get hurt and you now all of a sudden they need money from their annuity, they're going to be paying penalties on that to get it out early. Real estate investment trusts. A real estate investment trust is a real estate company. Basically, they are kind of like a mutual fund in that they buy properties instead of buying companies. Uh, but inside here, there are a couple of different animals. One of those would be a publicly traded REIT. That's the term I'll use, by the way. You pronounce that REIT. REIT. So the publicly traded REIT would trade just like a stock and it's going to bounce up and down every day as that real estate company trades in the open market. As you can imagine, you know, they're risky from a short-term standpoint. They can be risky in that they can trade up and down just like stocks. If something crazy happens in the world, you're probably going to see REITs go down just like you would stocks. So they have a high correlation to the stock market. The fees can be higher for sure than you would find in uh, other types of vehicles because real estate trusts are uh, going to be buying property directly. You're actually getting direct ownership in that company if you're a shareholder. And in some cases, they, they can be quite high. When we compare that against other companies like Coca-Cola though and Walmart, all, all these companies have operating expenses too. It's just if you're an owner in the real estate trust, they're having to disclose all of that to you in your your actual cost uh, versus if you own shares of Coke, you might think, oh, I don't pay anything for that. 
Oh, well, you do. You know, your profits are reduced by the fact that they've got operating expenses. So there are mutual funds that specialize in REITs. Uh, they can have expense ratios just like you would on normal mutual funds. And then private non-traded REITs can have extra expenses. There can be a wide range on these, again, because they're having to disclose all of that to you, all their operating expenses. Uh, one big benefit of REITs is that they actually have to, by law, they're, they're not required to pay corporate income taxes. So that actually can increase the yield that you can get off of them. Uh, but they have to pay out over 90% of their net earnings back to investors. So you know that actually you're getting most of the earnings. Most of the earnings of that company have to come back to you. And that's a requirement so they're able to avoid paying corporate income taxes. So we look at all these categories of different types of investments. And it can be a little bit confusing. I know our chart here can be confusing. But these are the primary vehicles that you would tend to find in your retirement account, your 401k, your IRA. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just getting over the cold that's going around <clears throat> right now. Got my water. All right. So we've got ETFs, mutual funds, annuities, and REITs. And we listed out here by investment objective the actual fees that you're paying. And then that third one, it is important to understand liquidity. In other words, how do I get out of this thing? I'm buying something, but how do I actually get out of this thing? And especially with annuities and REITs, you want to be real careful about those and to understand what it is exactly has to happen so you can get your money back out. In some cases, it can be a good thing. It, it may not end up being a bad thing that you own an annuity that has a longer period that you're committed for because maybe they're giving you some kind of an incentive for that. Maybe you're paying lower cost by committing for a longer time frame or you're getting some type of a better guarantee by waiting. A real estate trust, for example, it could be that it's a non-traded real estate portfolio that is raising capital and by doing that they're able to stay fully invested versus a normal real estate, a publicly traded real estate company might have to keep more liquid for redemptions. Uh, the non-traded real estate company, because of their back-end charges or commitment periods, they're able to more fully invest. So none of these are a bad thing. None of these vehicles that we're talking about are inherently bad vehicles. The problem is the disclosure and the fact that people just don't know what it is that they're getting or paying. Also, we want to understand risks and understand the risk, in my view, by the way, is not losing all your money because you put all your eggs in one basket. And I know that is a risk, certainly. You want to make sure that you don't have something that you'd lose all your money because one stock goes bad or one real estate holding goes bad. So if we're talking on the same page here, let's just assume that you're diversified in that if you own real estate, you probably own lots of different properties. If you own stocks, you probably own a lot of different stocks. So we're not talking about Enron risk or WorldCom risk, for example, of losing all your money because it was all put onto one holding. What we're talking about here is just market risk, and that's the risk that you really can't get rid of, unfortunately. We can't change the fact that world events, politics, all kinds of things on a daily basis end up influencing the ups and downs of the market. So that's the we can't get rid of, but we can manage it, and we can understand it, and we can understand why it is that things happen the way they do, and make sure that we're cool with that. And we want to make sure that what we own, we're actually going to be okay with that, both on the ups and the downs. We want to make sure that that investment can do the job that we're asking it to do and that we don't own something that actually has a lot higher risk than what we're, what we're asking. On the same token, we want to make sure that we're invested in a way that they can get a high enough return because for most of us, unless we're Donald Trump or somebody with gazillions of dollars, we don't have the money to be able to just put it in cash and just keep it in very, very conservative investments. We have to have some growth element to keep track with inflation and try to get some growth over time. Also, tax features important. Important to make sure that we understand how these things are taxed. What are the tax advantages? In some cases, there are tax advantages to certain types of investments. So we want to make sure that we understand that as well so there are no surprises. So weighing your options, when, there, when you look at how you could go out and get advice, one of the things that is a little bit newer out there is robo-advisors. And robo-advisors are a way that you actually can, it's, it's almost like a hybrid between being a completely do-it-yourself investor and somebody who really doesn't feel like they need a personal financial advisor. They, they don't need a human, in other words. They just need some type of a platform that is going to allow them to, to invest 
but there probably is some element in there of of some guidance or, or maybe a model type portfolio that you could be invested in instead of having to pick your own individual stocks or holdings. So there are a lot of financial websites that are out there. Uh, many companies have already started and folded up simply because when you have anything new, it's like dot coms back in the late 90s, right? How many of those companies are still around right now? Not many, right? Very few. So when you have something new like this, a lot of the companies will not make it. But some of them will, and it can be a viable option for somebody who's looking for that model. So it really depends on what level of advice that you're looking for, and really if you want personal advice, personal contact, a personal business relationship, versus just needing an investment platform online or, or technology tools to help you do your own thing. Brokerage firms are another typical place that people would have invested in. I don't think as much as they used to, especially after the financial crisis. What I mean by that is that it used to be a big status symbol if you invested with a big wirehouse firm, is what we call them, or a brokerage firm like Merrill Lynch, or traditionally you might have had something like a Smith Barney, Payne Weber. How many of these companies still exist? Uh, they don't. For example, Smith Barney and Payne Weber, neither one of those actually exist. They got gobbled up in the financial crisis. But it's important to understand that there's a significant disadvantage to investing with brokerage firms in that the difference of fiduciary status, remember we talked about that before, is quite large in that most brokerage firms, they do not act as fiduciaries. They act on a suitability standard, which is very, very watered down. For example, uh, suitability might be making sure that a 91-year-old woman doesn't own an aggressive growth stock fund. That would probably be unsuitable for her, but the bar is very, very low when it comes to protecting investors. Suitability is not a very good standard. Fiduciary is what you want to be looking for from anybody who's giving you financial advice. How do you know that I'm a fiduciary? Well, uh, first of all, the Department of Labor says that effective April of 2017 that I am, even if I hadn't been before, I suddenly become a fiduciary. The other thing is, though, that I, I already have been for years in that I'm a certified financial planner, and that's subject to a fiduciary standard. I'm also a registered investment advisor, representative, which means that I'm a fiduciary. So you want to be looking for that status. You want to make sure that they have to act in your best interest and that they don't have that watered down suitability standard. Also want to recognize that brokerage firms traditionally have been commission oriented and there typically were incentives for the people that were selling their products to recommend proprietary products. So it, it could be that we're going to pick up Merrill Lynch all day today, by the way. Uh, hopefully there's no big Merrill Lynch fans, uh, but they, they all kind of operate the same. If you own a Merrill Lynch mutual fund, for example, um, they, they could be offering some type of a sales incentive for their people that maybe they're offering a trip to Hawaii or something like that if they, they sell enough Merrill Lynch funds. So it's important to understand that, that there could be some certain things even in the background that you're not aware of that would sway them to be recommending one thing versus another. <clears throat> Excuse me. Advisory firms. Advisory firms, which are us, for example, we're an example of, of an of a advisory firm, is that we provide advice on a fee basis. So you're paying us a level cost over time. It's pay as you go, meaning that if you are not happy with what we're doing for you, you will be able to walk, transfer your account, and we stop getting paid. So it didn't involve a big upfront commission or something like that. Uh, that's 85% plus of our business is done that way. Uh, just for you clients that are here now, you're probably paying us exclusively or almost exclusively based off of the theme. There's a, a big variety. I, I think we're kind of big. You know, we're 135 million roughly right now in asset center management. So I think for a local firm here that's actually uh, you know fairly large, we're one of the larger firms here in the area, but you might find advisory service firms that are in the billions, for example. So it depends on what it is exactly that you're looking for. There's been a big levelization, I think, in the capabilities because of technology, because of scale, because of outsourcing. A lot of times firms like ours at 135 million can provide the advice and have the resources of a multi-billion dollar firm simply because of who we've partnered with and what type of technology we have available. 
Advisory firms, typically, what are they providing you? So bottom line is they're providing you advice. They're probably providing customized portfolio management as opposed to some type of a model. Uh, model meaning that if you're with a robo-advisor, they may have certain models that you just kind of plug into and it's not customized. You're not taking into account the fact that you may have a lot of tech stocks because you work for an HP or Intel <clears throat> and can adjust things uh, accordingly. Also, it can definitely range as far as what you're paying based off of what it is that you're getting. And that's important to recognize in that there are a lot of firms out there that are charging less than what we are, and there's also a lot of firms out there that are charging more than what we are. But the real question is, what are you getting for what it is that you're paying, and is there enough value or hopefully more value in that cost that it's making up for it, and, and you say, yep, that's a good deal. For example, as a CFP, I could do my own taxes. You know, it, it's not that I'm not smart enough, it's not that I'm not educated enough, and it's certainly not that there's not enough information out there, but it's worth its weight in gold, the fact that I don't have to do my own taxes, manage tax estimates throughout the year, uh, worry about keeping up on the tax code like a CPA would, so I gladly pay my CPA money to, to provide those services to me. For somebody else, that their tax situation may be very simple, they don't have a business like I do, Maybe it's, it's very simple, TurboTax does the job. For them, paying a CPA really wouldn't add enough value for it to make sense. So it's important to understand what it is exactly that you're getting, what type of advice you're getting. Is it just on the investments? Or are you getting financial planning advice? Are you getting the technology tools that allow you to be able to see things on your own? So you really want to look at it as what exactly is this firm delivering, and is there enough value in it that it's be either meeting the cost or hopefully multiples of that. That's our goal anyway at Keystone is that our clients think that we're easily worth what it is that they're paying and hopefully avoiding big mistakes and avoiding investment strategies that could be quite more expensive. We're able to help minimize those costs by what we're choosing. Brokerage versus advisory. Big difference there is commission versus fee. So you could almost substitute those two words for brokerage. You could say commission. Advisory fee. Uh, that's the big difference between the two. Some firms provide both. So Luke and I actually are licensed to be able to still offer commission products. And sometimes they're totally appropriate. They make a lot of sense. But in a lot of cases, advisory fees paying an ongoing cost over time for more active portfolio management makes sense. Other things, for example, like a real estate trust, a lot of times once we buy it, there's not a lot to do with it and it can end up being lower cost over time than paying an advisory fee on a different real estate portfolio. So we're always making sure that we're keeping our eye, our eye on both sides and recommending what's appropriate. Advantages of an advisory relationship, inherently, as you can imagine, there's less conflict of interest to be paying most of the compensation by an ongoing cost, one that will actually go up as your portfolio increases, that means that as we're entrusted with more of your assets, we're being paid more. And in particular, if our clients leave, we get paid less or none, right? The other side of it, too, is that if the investments increase in value, guess who participates? Well, you do primarily. You make most of the money, but we make some, too, as our assets go up in value. And the same thing happens is that we suffer when the market goes down. We suffer when your account value goes down. So there, there's something to that, I think, as far as having some skin in the game and being able to sit on the same side of the table. I hope you believe that that is a good way to operate. Also, it's important to make sure that the advice that you're getting is customized, that it's not just a cookie cutter, that you're actually sitting down with somebody who knows you. They know your family. They know your situation. They know your preferences. They know your likes, your dislikes, it's important that you trust them, that you believe that I know this person and I know that they're acting in my best interest. Years ago, I heard the best analogy from somebody who was sitting down with me. This is a client sitting down with me. And at the end of, of our discussion, she said, so what would you do if, if I was your mom? What would you do? And I think that's actually a really good benchmark on that, isn't it? it is we want to be able to provide you a relationship that you feel like you're getting it you know, as if it was a family member or your best friend. We want to make sure that you totally trust what it is that we're telling you 
and that we really are looking out for your best interest. Again, back to that fiduciary word. All right, we play a little video here. It's kind of cool. I think you'll like it. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that. A little bit of education, again, back to fiduciary, that word we were talking about. We're also part of a group called Carson Institutional Alliance, and that basically is a conglomeration of different independent fiduciary financial advisors throughout the country, and we share resources through them to be able to provide you the same things, the same advice, the same investment products that you would need hundreds of millions, if not billions in some cases, to be able to access. So pretty cool that we are like-minded in that we're trying to provide the highest quality of advice all across the country. So fiduciary, advisors serving investors in a fiduciary capacity, that is going to be the industry's highest standard. And again, P, oftentimes that's what you should be looking for as well as making sure that your financial advisor or financial planner, make sure they have CFP after their name because that is the gold standard in our industry. That's going to be the highest designation from an education standpoint, from an ethics standpoint, from a fiduciary standpoint, uh, ethics, accountability. These things are going to be the highest with the CFP. So you'll, you'll see the alphabet soup after people's names sometimes, and it's important to recognize that education is important, but the one that you really want to be looking for is CFP. You also want to make sure that they are the, the type of person who can be accountable and by enforcing that fiduciary standard, whether we, we like government intervention or not, Department of Labor has enforced that now that everybody having to be considered a fiduciary on retirement accounts is probably a good thing. I, I think it is personally. I think it's very confusing to investors to be out there seeing the title after somebody's name, financial advisor, financial planner, investment advisor, whatever you want to call yourself, consumers don't know. The average person doesn't know the fact that some people are not required to give them advice that's based on their best interest. So I think it's just assumed and in most cases people that have received bad advice probably were not working with a fiduciary. They probably were working with somebody that was based off of that suitability standard. So it's important that they understand your situation, that they really care, that you can trust them, and having that fiduciary standard tells you that it's not just somebody who's blowing smoke. It's not somebody who's just a good salesperson or is uh, somebody who can be real likable maybe and then can't deliver on what it is you're asking them to do. So it also can help eliminate conflict of interest because of the, the fact that you've got the suitability standard, you've got the fiduciary standard. With the fiduciary standard, they're required to disclose conflicts, conflicts of interest. 
they are required to to try to avoid them, you know, if at all possible, but at the very least to be able to disclose that to you so you are getting a fair shake. You really know that you're getting objective advice. Communication is important as well. You really want to make sure that you're working with somebody who's a good communicator and that they've got a team that can communicate. So some of the things that we do that you'll notice is that and we, we actually just started launching trade notifications here within the last week. That means that any type of transaction that happens within your account, you actually receive the trade notification from us telling you not just that the transaction happened, but why it happened. So I think that's important from an accountability standpoint that we're providing that to you. Also that education, back to education, it's important that you still have some involvement in your financial situation. I don't think it's appropriate at all for somebody to hire some type of advisor and then just set it and forget it. You know, they, they say, well, I'm going to go live my life and I never want to talk about this stuff. It's important that you stay somewhat informed and make sure that you understand the why behind things. So market commentaries, newsletters, summaries, videos, webinars like this, we really try to do our best to make sure that we're providing you enough education that You've got it. You've got more information than you need in most cases, but we want to make sure that it's there, that it's available, and that you're not kept in the dark. Finally, it's important to ask the right questions. So, if you're out there in the marketplace right now and you're trying to find an advisor, or if you happen to be one of our clients, and maybe some of these things are not as clear to you as you'd like them to be, these are the types of questions you should be asking. Number one, how do you get paid? Uh, when we're talking to a prospective client, that's one of the first things that I bring up to them if they don't ask it of us, is I say, do you know how we get paid? And then we, we kind of talk through it as far as the difference between commission-based and fee-based and the fact that they would primarily be paying us a fee. Uh, if commissions, how are those determined? Is it based off of the, uh, you know, what, what it is that you're investing in? Is it based off of what product company they're investing in or what type of product? So it's important to, to know what that is, to make sure that you're aware of it. Also important to understand if there's any other types of fees, commissions, revenue sharing, bonuses, other stuff that they get that results from you paying your commissions or fees inside your account. In other words, is there stuff that you're not seeing that you're actually paying for? Uh, do I have any choice in how I pay you? In some cases, there's not a choice depending on how they're licensed. For some people, they may not even be licensed to do fee-based planning or fee-based investment advice, so it may be that you have to pay them a commission. In some cases, for example, back to those indexed annuities and fixed annuities, people that sell those are not required to have a securities license. They're not required to be a CFP. They're not required to be a registered investment advisor. So the standards can be very low. It may be that all that they had to do was go get an insurance license, which I remember my, taking my life insurance exam years ago and it wasn't very hard. It really was not a, a very high standard and one that I think you should allow somebody to run around out there and, and sell products. Lots of examples of people who have walked in that have worked with advisors that really were not competent and qualified to be able to give that type of advice. Fee schedule. It should be very clear. It should not be something that they have to fumble around and say, well, it depends and you know, it could be this and it could be that. It should be a pretty straightforward discussion. And if they're not comfortable talking about it, to me, that's a pretty red flag. I would, uh, I'd be very concerned about somebody who is evasive or can't just answer the question straightforward. They should be able to provide you a fee schedule or be able to just give you a, a flat out answer. For example, that our fees are X. Here's how you pay. Here's how that is deducted from your account or how you pay them. Uh, also, are you paying any other types of transaction fees or advisory fees that weren't disclosed in the previous? Is there something else that is out there that you could be paying? And finally, if lower fees could be uh, received in different types of accounts, and I can tell you that is true, it's always true, that some types of accounts or some types of investments are going to be lower cost than others, so it's important to know that. And then finally, do I need to keep a minimum account balance to avoid certain fees? Most frequently, this would be like a custodial fee on an IRA. Sometimes on smaller retirement accounts, the custodians like Fidelity, they may charge you an annual fee because your account isn't over a certain level. So that also can eat into expenses. Again, it, it may be something you're fine with paying, but you just want to make sure that you understand what it is. So 
I think that's a, a pretty concise, quick way to go over some of the right questions to ask. Again, I would be asking them flat out, are you a fiduciary? I would be asking them, are you a CFP? What types of advanced designations do you have? What types of things do you do to keep yourself educated and keep yourself up to date on things that are happening in the world, the markets, the tax law, the estate law, all the things that we have to abide by. You want to make sure that that person has to keep up on that and that they're not somebody who got their license 20 some years ago and that's all they did, right? That they never went back and, and kept up on changes. As we all know, the world changes dramatically and we need to make sure that we're keeping up with them. So finally, I was going to show you our new picture. We just got taken this taken a couple weeks ago. Isn't that cool? We uh, got our new team photo taken, and we have a new website launching here soon. We're actually really proud of that, so please keep an eye out for that. While we're doing the wrap-up here, though, please ask questions. If you've got some questions on things that I did not address, you can type those into your chat, and I'd be happy to answer those. While that may be accumulating, or maybe not, maybe I'm just so good at it that I, I told you everything. Uh, just kidding. I, there's always more to learn. That's the thing I, I know for sure is there's a lot that I don't know. As much time as we spend educating ourselves and preparing, we know there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And oftentimes that's one of the wisest things, I think, is to understand that you don't know everything and you need to be acting accordingly. So. You see here is the five of us here in Loveland, Colorado, and we've got various roles within our organization, but more than anything, I can tell you that we are all very well trained, experienced, and that we care. We really deeply care about our clients. We aim to treat you like family, and not only is that nice when you come into the office and we get to catch up on family stuff, but really I think that's where trust is built is the fact that we can sit across the table from each other and that you can tell by looking at each other that, hey, this person really cares about me. They really have taken the time to understand, to listen, to really get where I am and have the diligence to be able to follow that through with advice. So looking at the questions, I don't have any questions that pop up right now. I will start to wrap it up here. So you, you'll need to frantically start typing here if you have a question that you'd like us to address on the presentation. However, I would always invite you to email us. My email address is josh at keystonefinancial.org, as is the rest of the team. We've got Lucas at keystonefinancial.org, and Renee and Grace and Melissa. So feel free to reach out to us if you have individual questions. I'd also encourage you to keep up on our website, make sure you're on our mailing list so we can invite you to more of these things. And I think that's it for today. I appreciate you sharing some time on your Friday. And remember that we always want to end with giving you something, and that is that we have a white paper that we have that we can send you in a PDF format that addresses much of this presentation. So this will be recorded so you can listen to it. You might also enjoy the white paper and might enjoy forwarding that on to somebody else that you know. So if you'd like that, please let us know by emailing us and you could just email it to me. That's easy enough. Josh at keystonefinancial.org. We are a for-profit company, by the way. That's kind of funny. People bring that up. But, you know, why did you choose org? Because com was taken. So we took org uh, six years ago when we were founded. And I can tell you that we are absolutely a for-profit company. We are enjoying what we're doing. It's, it's fun to make money and be a business and also be able to make a big impact on people's lives. So with that being said, I hope you guys have a great weekend. I appreciate you attending, and please follow up and ask for that white paper, again, by emailing me at josh at keystonefinancial.org. That's all I need, and have a great weekend.